Are you also able to see how many people are watching on YouTube? Yes, uh, at the moment we have 29. In the morning we had the 88 times. Yeah. Yeah, but we had 150 plays, so some people started but didn't finish. All right, I made it 29 minutes past. So, uh, maybe I will. Um, well, Jordan's ready, his slides are up. So, as soon as we hit over the 30 minutes, we'll get started. There we go. So, I'm uh, welcoming Jordan Collier to the second part of the, uh, the workshop that we're running today. And he's going to tell us about the Meerkat tool belt. And he's going to play on words with a waste of data. Uh, so take it away, Jordan. Thanks very much. So yes, I'm Jordan Collier. I'm the Alifu support astronomer, Alifu being a facility that I'll tell you about. And I'm from IDEA, the Inter-University Institute for Data Intensive Astronomy. Essentially, this institution exists to solve the data intensive challenges to do with uh, Meerkat, the um, square kilometer array precursor in South Africa and then kind of build up the expertise to be able to do that uh, within South Africa and then basically be ready for the challenges to do with the square kilometer array. And I just want to acknowledge my uh, collaborators and um, colleagues that I've listed here. Um, I'm getting a little distracted by the noise. So if um, those not speaking could mute, that would be very helpful, thank you. So no doubt many, if not all of you, will have heard of the Square Kilometre Array, the SKA. Uh, this is a global mega science partnership. Um, it's a multi-billion dollar project to build the world's largest telescope in South Africa and Australia. And it will answer many of the questions um, that we've dreamed to answer for a long time, um, in particular, the history of hydrogen within the universe. And it'll also answer questions that um, we haven't even asked yet, questions that we don't even know exist. Um, those serendipitous discoveries that tend to be the most exciting historically. And so this, this uh, instrument that will be built in these two countries um, essentially can't be done today at its full scale because the technology doesn't exist. The, um, the engineering, the computing, the networking, the power, and the science basically don't exist to do this yet. And so what we've done is we've ramped up toward this with the precursors and pathfinders around the world, which are essentially steps to be able to one day uh, soon, hopefully, uh, be able to do SKA. And so one of those is Meerkat, which is South Africa's precursor to the SKA. And a huge number of technical challenges are needing to be overcome to be able to deliver the SKA and Meerkat and the other precursors and pathfinders are addressing this in part by solving the data intensive challenges and related challenges to do uh, with actually deploying and doing science with those instruments. So at IDEA, we're particularly focused on the computational challenges and we're working to develop a facility modeling an SKA data center or regional center. So for instance, um, the kind of cloud technology that we've um, used in order to solve these problems, the data transfers, the software stack and containers, the processing ideally done by pipelines, the visualization and data quality analysis. And I'll particularly focus on those in bold, but I'll touch on all of them. So if you don't know, much about Meerkat. It's a 64 dish interferometer. That means it's an array of connected dishes. Uh, they're each 13 and a half meters in diameter. And that means that there's 2016 pairs or baselines with a maximum separation of eight kilometers, which determines your resolution, basically how small of an angle you can resolve, which is six arc seconds, uh, which is essentially six, 3,000 six hundredth of a degree. It's uh, a very sensitive instrument, essentially 70% better than it was designed to be, uh, which is basically unheard of, 
historically. So it's incredibly sensitive. It um, can reach uh, very deep uh, sensitivities very quickly. Uh, and this is over its observing frequency from 580 to 3500 megahertz uh, with an instantaneous bandwidth of 856 megahertz, although the usable band is a little smaller than that. And then it has 32K spectral channels. Uh, so this is essentially channels um, dividing into frequency. And this is important for determining uh, things like the velocity of neutral hydrogen um, moving away from you in the universe, as well as its rotation within galaxies and things like that. You can determine fine details um, to do with those velocities. And so the telescopes here out in the northern Karoo in South Africa, basically there's nothing there. So there's very little interference. That's near the town of Carnarvon. And then down in Cape Town, we've got this, um, the observatory, the South African Radio Astronomy Observatory. They operate uh, the telescope and have their headquarters for observing there to do so remotely. Uh, and they also, um, yeah, they host the data within the archive and do real-time processing and so on. And then we have the Alifu facility, which is very close by to where the data ends up there. And this is what I'll describe um, from yeah, the work I'm involved in. And then perhaps some of you have seen this galactic center image. This is a demonstration of the capabilities of Meerkat. It's a very beautiful image of the center of our galaxy, revealing detail never seen before uh, due to its sensitivity and also sensitivity to large scale structures. And so this was um, an image that uh, was used to inaugurate Meerkat. It uh, was made by Ian Haywood from the University of Oxford and from Rhodes University. And um, yeah, it was processed at IDEA. So it was a very important kind of proof of concept to do with the data rates, the transfers, the processing, and being able to do this kind of um, imaging and science. So you can check out the publications to do with that. It's quite an exciting result there. Uh, but the projects that dominate MECAT are called large survey projects. And these are those that are awarded more than a thousand hours of observing time. And here I've basically just broken them up into imaging projects. So those that are interested in making images to do their science. And then those that are interested in the time domain. Um, so generally uh, they're measuring voltages and looking for transient and variable objects. But Thundercat does both. It looks for uh, variability and transient phenomena within uh, image images uh, over different time scales. And so IDEA, uh, basically offer services uh, after the, ob the observations are carried out, uh, all the way from data transfer through to processing and visualization and much in between, but these are those that I'll mainly touch on. So the hardware we use to do this is LIFU. Uh, this is the tier two data intensive research facility. That's a joint cloud platform between astronomy and bioinformatics. Generally, all of the projects are making use of the cluster, but we do offer a few kind of specific services on what we call fat nodes. These are essentially dedicated machines for certain projects. And this really constitutes a Pathfinder Science Regional Data Center. And as I say, like a Pathfinder SKA Regional Center. It's got 116 nodes each with 32 CPUs. Uh, it runs at 2.6 gigahertz on those um, machines. And then generally we offer 256 gigabytes of RAM on those nodes, but um, we do have a couple of high memory nodes uh, for certain processes as well. Then we have more than six petabytes of raw storage between our BGFS and CFFS file systems, uh, which is uh, quite large and necessary for um, data such as from Meerkat as well as other projects. And we offer 10 gigabit a second fast network access to essentially all the research institutions within South Africa. But then beyond just the hardware, we offer uh, support, uh, in particular astronomy support and system support. And so, for instance, we purpose build software containers using Singularity. We offer a research service for uh, processing, analysis, storage, access and transport and so on. 
And so any member of one of these large survey projects could get access to Ilifu and uh, have these services offered and the support offered by IDEA, as so long as they get permission from the principal investigator of that project. And so this actually means because there's lots of different projects, we need to consider um, uh, the access to that data and particularly the proprietary data. And so at the moment, we just use LDAP to do that, which is that simple Linux uh, accounting management software. And yeah, we set up these accounting groups and that uh, manages the access to the data and it also uh, enables us to um, use through Sloam our job management and um, um, yeah, queuing software uh, to basically put the different processing under those different accounting groups um, so that we know kind of the usage of the different projects and can look at the way that they uh, vary. And so here's a typical software stack for a project doing Meerkat processing. So we use OpenStack to deploy Linux VMs and we offer a Jupyter Hub interface, uh, which spawns basically an instance on the cluster uh, according to the resources that you select. Um, we also obviously offer uh, SSH access and um, that interface. And then if you're doing um, parallel processing, you're probably using OpenMPI across multiple nodes and you're submitting that via Sloam, which is the job management and scheduling software. You're probably using a singularity container to run your software and within that, uh, the CASA radio astronomy um, software, which is basically the standard Pack, uh, the standard um, software suite for doing radio astronomy uh, processing. So this is kind of our typical software stack for such a use case. And so we have these different use cases. Um, um, apologies if um, the language doesn't make a whole lot of sense here. I'll try and explain, but essentially we have uh, what we'd call full Stokes continuum images and cubes. So this essentially means we're interested in the polarization properties uh, within uh, galaxies, uh, within a particular field, within a particular patch of sky. Um, but then we also have continuum subtracted cubes and moment maps. This essentially means you're interested in looking at neutral hydrogen and its kinematics within galaxies or perhaps clusters of galaxies. So I've just listed the different large survey projects that are interested in those different components. And then in the case of Thundercat, they're mostly interested in multi-epoch images, as I said, looking at variability and transient behavior between those epochs. So uh, to first start on data transfer, <coughs> we um, have a dedicated service um, between uh, Sareo, where the data are uh, hosted, basically after an observation is taken, uh, the data lands there. And then we have uh, a service where we can push the data straight to IDEA. Uh, and this uses a grid FTP backend and a dedicated link between the two. And basically the user comes along and pushes the button, uh, usually it's the PI. And then you'll get the the raw format of data called a measurement set that's directly transferred to the appropriate directory. Basically, we take care of all the permissions and things like that. And the PI and support team will be notified about that. It will include any data selection parameters and volumes. For instance, if they only small, if they only choose a small selection, then that's relevant because you know there's only a small volume coming. And then based on whether that succeeds or fails, you'll get a notification email. So here's the interface from the Sereo archive. And if you can see there, uh, it's literally a button to push to IDEA. And then that will take care of, um, yeah, all of that that I just mentioned. Um, but beyond that, we actually offer Globus as a service to the user. So this is a kind of, user-friendly interface built on top of grid FTP. So it's got a GUI as well as a web app, uh, sorry, a web app, which is essentially the GUI and then a command line interface. Uh, and 
It can connect to any arbitrary endpoints, ideally a server like a data transfer node, uh, but you can connect it to your desktop, whether that's Mac, Windows, or Linux. So this is computationally efficient by user-friendly service that we offer to the users. Uh, and this is also what is happened to be used uh, from the dedicated link between Sereo and IDEA. So it converts to the raw format measurement set, transfers the raw data, which is typically about 12 terabyte for 12 terabytes for eight hours of data at this full spectral slash frequency resolution of 32K. So it's quite large volumes. And generally, you know, we're talking about at least one of these a day if we're um, in the middle of a season of a project that ID is supporting. And then the processing, and I'll spend a bit of time covering this, um, I firstly want to just touch on the real-time processor, which is the SDP, the Science Data Processor. And so this is done within real time. Um, it's quite a detailed uh, figure that I've come up with here, but you don't need to know about all the details. Um, essentially, I guess one of the cool things is what's listed at the bottom here as basically what gets stored in the archive. So you have the visibilities, which is this raw data. Uh, in this case, it's not actually measurement sets, um, but it's their own format, which is essentially um, when you pull it, to, it's dask arrays. They have solutions, which is essentially something you can apply to those visibilities in order to correct them, to calibrate them. You have flags, which is to do with um, problematic data. And again, that's just associated with the visibilities. So rather than, um, yeah, applying these to your only copy of the data, you rather store them separately. So you can choose, okay, I want to apply these flags or perhaps these more stringent flags. And so this is available to you kind of on the fly as you interact with the data. And then one of the things I'm working on um, is data quality metrics. Uh, and ideally we want to store these along with the data and um, able to be kind of applied as a constraint as you interact with the data as well. And then you've got a calibration report with those metrics as well. But the, um, the processing and the pipeline I want to spend the most time on is um, the IDEA process meerkat pipeline. Uh, this is a project overseen by my colleague Brad Frank um, with myself and my colleague Krishna as the primary developers with algorithmic input from Russ Taylor. So we recently revert, uh, released version 1.1, which is under performance testing by these large survey projects. So essentially it gives you this full Stokes calibration in this CASA suite. So this again means um, with the uh, calibrated for polarization. Uh, and it's a parallelized package for high performance computing. So it uses Slurm, it uses our cluster, and it uses this particular format of data called the multi-measurement set uh, where we choose to partition into chunks of time and parallelize the processing across the cluster um, by each worker receiving one of these uh, scans in time. And I guess I don't need to convince you about, um, yeah, it's kind of use case and, and what it addresses and what's good about it. Uh, you can go and check out the documentation for that. Uh, apologies, I didn't put the link in here, but if you just Google uh, this heading, this title here, that you'll be able to see that. Um, but I guess um, one of the things that we're aiming to do is to calibrate within the time it takes to observe, so typically about eight hours. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about um, the way that this is kind of a good, um, yeah, like a good um, solution, a good framework. Um, but one of the things that I'll highlight is the way that it's kind of split up into steps that do and don't use MPI. Uh, so that do and don't use um, more than a single CPU. And basically the um, flexibility that you're given to be able to do this. And so just a quick bit of detail for those that are interested. So we first, this is basically for a single spectral window as we call them, which is a frequency chunk. Uh, we first convert the raw format into one of these multi-measurement sets. We then calculate antenna statistics. So we can use that to flag certain antennas perhaps or select a reference antenna. 
and then we do a pre-calibration set of flagging. So this is to get rid of the worst interference that's interfering with the real signal. And that enables us to then do a parallel hand calibration. So this is uh, without interest in polarization at this point. Uh, and then once we've done that, we can do much tighter flagging of this interference with tighter thresholds, which then allows us to do a final full Stokes calibration appropriate for polarization. And then we kind of end up splitting out the data of interest, usually a single target field. We produce quick look images and we plot the solutions to look at how well our calibration performed. And so I'll show some of those results in a moment, but first just to highlight, um, as we run these steps, we're able to produce pipeline diagnostics to benchmark the different steps. So for instance, this is showing the memory profile across an imaging run using a particular task called tclean from the CASA suite. Uh, this is showing the reads and writes, and then this is showing the CPU usage across that imaging run. And so, uh, yeah, what we have now splits uh, into a further um, set of um, uh, further partitions the data into frequency. So we have splitting by scan in time, which is that CASA format. And then we have our own format to further split into frequency windows. And this provides a speed up since you can simultaneously process these. And then it also pr provides a better, uh, more reliable wideband polarization um, uh, uh, approach uh, since essentially CASA isn't what we call rotation measure aware. So this essentially means that it's not sensitive to the polarization properties within a single frequency band. And so typically we're for these raw data of about 12 terabytes, we're completing this in several hours here. I've got a um, cumulative wall time plot. So if we were to do a default pipeline, which the majority of them are, we're talking about no parallelism and we're talking about these kind of runtimes. This is actually for data averaged heavily in frequency by 32 uh, channels. And so we get 1K data in the end. It's actually dramatically smaller in size, yet still to run this entire routine without parallelism takes quite a while. Uh, and then when we partition by time and frequency and both, you can see the result of that. Or even more significantly, if we look at the full spectral resolution at 32K, and you can see the log scale here, um, then you can see it's a dramatic improvement once we use the full parallelism. So I'm just gonna try and fly through and finish here. Uh, so here's some results of the quick look images. These are very quick and dirty, essentially for quality assurance. Um, but to go beyond this, we're looking at self-calibration where we have a broad algorithm locked in place and it's currently routinely used. And soon we'll be extending to what we call third generation calibration. This is essentially the fact that as you observe, a particular source moves through a position within um, your antenna that is attenuated uh, differently. And so you have to account for that um, difference in attenuation through something called AW projection. And so that's currently being worked on by my colleague along with the NREO CASA algorithm research and development group. And so that's very promising at this point. Um, and so I guess watch this space. So here's an example of a self-calibrated images uh, image that reaches about seven microjansky per beam, which is quite deep. It's not as deep as you can get, but it's, um, also over 100 megahertz in bandwidth. So it's pretty much getting close to the limit of what you can do. And here's a um, full broadband image uh, that gets to about five microjansky per beam. And so, as I mentioned, uh, this very much represents a good framework by being HPC friendly and also splitting up into steps that do and don't use MPI, as well as being able to insert a script at any point. So perhaps you prefer a different imaging software like WS Clean, and you can very much do that. The framework supports it. So then lastly, um, data visualization. What's important here is that rather than bring the data to the user, we actually bring the user to the data. And so we used Carter to do this, uh, which is the cube analysis and rendering tool for astronomy. Uh, and it's a cloud-based remote, remote visual analytics uh, and large of large imaging cubes. So it's mainly aimed 
uh, it's looking at large data, big data, and it solves a lot of the issues to do with visualizing big data, um, such as, uh, yeah, only wanting to inspect a certain chunk of it at a time rather than load in the entire uh, image. And then, uh, yeah, things to do with like um, front end rendering versus back end. So it doesn't need to reload in the data and so on. There's a whole bunch of things. You ought to go check out the URL and use the tool for yourself. I was hoping to do a demo. Maybe if we get time in question time, you can tell me if that's possible. So for now, given the amount of time left, I'm going to skip that and just uh, mention the data quality assessment um, that we also offer at IDEA, which is essentially you take the end products from output from a pipeline, the images and the catalogs, and you present a report that summarizes the data quality. It has these metrics and flags associated with whether it's bad or uncertain or good. And these are available to the user as something that they can do to inspect data quality. And then of course, all of this is kind of uh, developing what's necessary to exist in order to deal with SKA, the 2,500 fiber connected dishes in Southern Africa. And so as my last slide before the summary, um, in terms of considering the SKA and its requirements, I think the choice of technologies is quite important. Uh, we need to consider authentication for the various services as well as access to proprietary data. One of the solutions we're investigating is key cloak, which allows for a single sign on service. And then in terms of operations between whatever region or center you have and the data processor, I think you very much need automated parallel processing that's well tested and robust and dynamic. And I think you need automated quality assessment uh, with some kind of final report available to the users. Ideally, diagnostic plots of visibilities, this raw data, as I mentioned, this very slow in general, and Carter's aiming to tackle this. So hopefully they'll provide a solution there. And then perhaps the ability to actually go back and reprocess based on the quality assessment. This is something that I posed for SKA. That's probably not possible, but perhaps for other projects, this is something that can be done. And then you need to consider the data transfers as you serve out the data to the end users, as you archive it, and as users interact with the archive data, and ideally can query them based on the metrics and other metadata. This is something the ASCAP, the Australian Square Kilometre Array Pathfinders Archive CASDA does very well, which I was involved in too. And then we need to consider the support and the training of these end users of the data. So given the time, I'm going to leave my summary slide there. Apologies for going a little over. I guess we have Hey, very good. No worries. A few minutes for time uh, for questions. Uh, we do, and there was a little mistake in the agenda. So there's actually 30 minutes extra in this session, which means I can allow you to even run over a little bit, and you could probably do your <laughs> demo if it was going to be pretty quick. There are three questions. Sure. Two are from me, <laughs> and one from Luis. Um, <laughs> so I was just wondering what your group access, because you say you use LDAP. Do you have like an interface where the users can create their own groups and then share their data sets with that group of people? also connected to the LDAP? No, we don't. So we manage it for them. Okay. Um, yeah, so we essentially set up the groups and we interact generally with a PI who specifies who the members should be. And um, we review that once a year, um, make sure emails are up to date as well as that users who should be in the group are and others um, who shouldn't be aren't. Um, but yeah, we manage this for them. And um, yeah, that doesn't stop them from requesting it at any point through our ticketing system. But so far, this has worked fine for our like uh, roughly more than 200 users. And Luis was asking about the timetable for the full sky cat. What's happening in Australia? For the what? Full sky. The full sky catalog, I guess he means, yeah. Is that the uh, racks, the rapid? Um, all sky continuum survey from ASCAP, is that what you mean? No, the full implementation of SCA. SCA. I oh, mean, you sorry, just have sorry. the... Sorry, I thought you said sky. Uh, <laughs> the full sky implementation record. of the SKA. Yeah, they used to say SCA back in the day, but everyone says SKA these days. Um, Apologies. <laughs> no, no, that's fine, that's fine. I think you can say that if you want. Um, so I, I'm not too sure to be honest, I've been a little bit removed from that. Um, 
I'm sure there are people on YouTube at least watching that know this question and know the answer quite well. It's probably best if I don't guess since um, I could be wildly wrong. I mean, if I guess later, I'll probably be closer to right since these things are so delayed. But You can always uh, look it up and post it in the Slack channel later. We'll, we'll pick it up. That would be yeah. fun. Um, sure. the, uh, Richard Dubois was asking how many FTEs you have for QA, and I was wondering, those QA images, are they coming out at the end of your pipeline, or are they faster than the pipeline? Yeah, um, so I guess what I described is what we do at IDEA. Um, which is removed from the observatory where they run their real-time processing. And so this is very much at the end of the pipeline, uh, what I've implemented so far. So it's uh, the, the, theory, the idea is that if the end products are good, then pretty much the earlier products ought to be good as well. If it's no good, then the reverse isn't necessarily true because it could have gone wrong at any stage. Yeah. But... Um, we yeah, started with end products since that's the simplest. Um, and so that's what we're doing at IDEA, pretty much just me working on that and mainly looking at that. But at, at um, Soraya, the observatory, they do have their own real time uh, processing and that comes with metrics. I worked a little on that um, in order to provide real time metrics. Um, but then I kind of changed positions and stopped working on that. So I'm a little familiar with it and there's at least one other, I think two others actually working on that. Uh, not at full time though. So maybe at best one FTE for all of Meerkat. That's somewhat of a guess since I'm a little removed, but. And, and that includes the industry. execution of the pipelines or just the QA? No, just the QA, the okay. execution. There's a whole team working on, on the software and yeah, there's like a, a astronomer on duty 24 seven. And okay. there's a lot more, uh, yeah, FTE there. Uh, so we we do have a little bit of extra time. At least five people were interested in seeing your demo uh, according to the thumbs up on, okay. on Slack. Uh, no sure, one we'll... said no. Uh, okay. Go ahead, me... I think, if you can do that go. in a couple of minutes. And then Alex, you'll be up next whenever, when he's finished in about five minutes. We'll, we'll run ahead a bit quicker. So I want to do this in a kind of roundabout way, which is to connect to quite a distant Carter server, which is the one at Pawsey in Australia. And I guess I have to assure you that when I tested this before, it worked very well. Um, already, this is performing very slow. I'm not sure why. But um, what I want to do here is just demonstrate me in Cape Town visualizing a very large cube at Pawsey in Western Australia, and then rendering that to you wherever you are in the world. Uh, so, sorry triple tapped there so i can go into this directory that i have and i can look at the cube that i have here um, which is almost 2.5 terabytes in size so if you try and open this with something like casa viewer which is somewhat of a standard then it takes hours basically but i can just load that cube in and then say go to the animator go to a random channel. Hopefully there's no signal that I'm not supposed to be showing. <laughs> and so I can go to that channel within this approximately 2.5 terabyte cube. It renders it pretty quickly. I can say change the color map and it's instantaneous since that's using the front end to do that. It's not um, recomputing anything. Or I could look, change the transfer function here again, instantaneous. I could change this to log scale. So this is all very quick um, interactivity with this very large cube. There's a whole bunch of stuff I could show, but I think that's one of the main performance things that I wanted to show you. Um, just, yeah, as I say, visualizing this data quite far from me, uh, that's very large in size and I can do so not quite as um, well as if I was there, but um, very quickly. Impressive. Um, Okay, then there were no more questions. Uh, I would like to thank you very much and people can give you a virtual applause with the reactions on there and we'll, uh, we'll get Alex up. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so, yeah, so we're running a little bit ahead of 25 minutes or so ahead of schedule because of uh, the agenda having a slight mistake in it and missing a 30 minutes where a talk was taken out. Um, so next we have uh, Alex Chalet from Johns Hopkins from the uh, Ideas uh, 
where he's uh, interested in the future of long-term data. And we all know Alex has been long-term in big data and long-term data preservation. So take mm -hmm. away, Alex. Thanks. <coughs> yeah, so we are in the so year of... Just so you, we're seeing a lot of... Uh, your desktop but, and, and oh i saw the, sorry i thought i was sharing actually one sec yeah. i want meant to share my powerpoint yeah exactly. sorry thanks yeah. <laughs> so we are in the era of surveys and this is really about we are transiting from the manufacture of scientific data into the industrial revolution and this is of course not unique to astronomy. In a way, we are following the tracks of particle physics, which in particle physics started with the Van der Graaffs at around the turn of the century, then evolved into the cyclotron, then the synchrotrons and then the national labs. And then of course, the next alternative was whether we build the SSC or LHC. And we know what happened, that essentially we needed an international collaboration over the whole planet to be able to build the next generation of big experiments. So the big science projects are entering the multi-billion dollar regime. And the talk by Jordan was just the perfect example of that, where which create an open data archive that are analyzed by large communities. But this creates a huge difference in the way science is done. So in the past, we had experiments that were rapidly following one another. And the data sets therefore had a short lifetime because sooner or later, the data set that was the result of one experiment was superseded by the next one, which was slightly bigger and slightly better. But we don't see these experiments, multi-billion dollar experiments to be superseded too quickly. So today's experiments typically take you know, a decade to build the instrument, then at least a decade to operate it, maybe more. And very likely the results will not be surpassed by another in our lifetime. So the data is here to stay. But <clears throat> today the science environment is changing actually again very rapidly. So for a long time we lived in this bimodal world where we had small PI projects with the individual PI or small team NSF grants or federal grants versus then and there was this emerging big science project on the other end. And what we see these days actually over the last 15 or 20 years gradually a lot of projects have been growing into the middle. The NSF mid-scale projects you know, the NASA MIDEX program, the NIH U01 programs, there were private collaborations or public private partnerships like Sloan or PFS, where a combination of universities put together money and then with some contributions from foundations and the federal agencies. And so the typical goal of these projects is now to create a unique instrument, use a cutting edge technology, take risks, push budgets to the limit, to maximize science. And in a sense, this tries to counterbalance a little bit the risk adversiveness of the big projects, which are usually micromanaged by the agencies. And they have to freeze their technologies probably 10 years before the instrument gets deployed or, or five years before the instrument gets deployed. So they are like big spacecraft or big space missions. And it turns out that we see right in front of our eyes, I think in astronomy we know all too well how much enormous fresh intellectual energy has been liberated by these projects, where typically the PIs are also mid-career people, so not, not the old pundits. And so they are really have a razor sharp focus on maximizing the science. And, and I really strongly believe that this rep, these projects represent right now the sweet spot for science, because there is only so, many, so much that you can do on an individual small grant. And the big science projects have this large inertia and risk adversiveness, which is needed to carry out these ginormous missions, but, but it is not as cost efficient as, as you know, as a somewhat smaller project. But one other thing is that pushing budgets to the limit and beyond, that usually by the time these projects start to create data, they spend their budgets on the instrument. And they realize that there is not enough money left to build a computing infrastructure. And I think that I have seen this in front of my eyes for, in many projects. 
And so the result is that the, they try to do the computations on a shoestring. And a good example is the Event Horizon Telescope, where they were sending hard disks around the world from one computing facility to another until they were able to put all the data together and do the computations. So the general pattern is the computations in this world will be done opportunistically. So they certainly need some storage to actually capture the data from the instrument. But then they try to move this data wherever there is free compute available, you know, be it at Slack or at Fermilab or at one of these exit supercomputer centers in the US. So in this new computing model, it seems to violate basically the principle that take your computation where the data is. That is ideal if you have the money to do it. But, but here the problem is that we have to take our data you know, and it, where we can get free computer time and it in a way it doesn't matter where the computations are done. And you can, I think you can do this in the mid scale. There is another aspect, agility versus tenacity. So, so, you know, where are we heading in this mad rush forward with AI, where basically the Google, Facebook and Microsoft and open mind or, or deep mind and Google are building basically tools that simply universities cannot, uh, cannot compete. So at the university's faculty hires are for 40 years. Jeff Dean's group at Google grew from five people to 5,000 in a matter of a few years or the people at Google working on AI related. This is impossible in a university environment. But there is an area where we can compete, which is tenacity and in creating high value data. So the attention span in the industry for science has been there, but it has been notoriously spotty. And generally lots of few years at most. So there is somebody interested in helping scientists. They come up with a nice demo project which shows off the technology. And then that person, if it's in the company, moves sideways or up, upwards or out. And then suddenly everything gets dropped on the floor. So at the universities, we can actually, and, and in the academic environment, we can actually create these mid-scale data generating projects. When they grow to 10 to 50 million, this data will also not be superseded too easily and too quickly. And even creating them will take a decade or more. Think about all, this, all the sky surveys that we are all involved in. So most of the people who are around these screens. And most of these data sets will also be here for decades. So maybe they don't cost a billion dollars, but they cost a hundred million. And there will be even more mid-scale projects coming. And there is now an increasing demand to make these data sets AI ready, to make it easy to interface in, in artificial intelligence toolkits and to feed them into TensorFlow and PyTorch and so on. And what we have seen is that the big breakthroughs will still come even in the future when, when we will be using a lot of AI tools from a unique data set. So which will be combined with a disruptive idea. If you just think that ImageNet was basically the data set that moved deep learning forward by basically a quantum jump. So how do we do long-term access to data? And it's wonderful to have these fair principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reproducible. But when you look at it, we had so far a total failure on capturing the small data sets, the long tail of data because we made it, to, it is too simply, even today, it is too hard to actually publish your data in a format that is, ex, that, that is acceptable for the people who are the curators of data. So we need uh, exponentially more automation because the manual approach just cannot keep up. But also I find that in FAIR, there are a couple of other things missing. How about free and sustainable? So FAIR deliberately doesn't say that the data access needs to be free because it didn't want to lock out the commercial publishers. But there are increasing expectations that scientific data should be open and free. But what happens to these high value large data sets when they are completed? So when you look at free, accessible and sustainable, these are like the three principles of project management you know, budget features and timelines and pick any two and the third is determined. 
So when you think about it, if you want something basically that is free and really accessible, somebody has to actually pay for the gradual improvement of the infrastructure. So that is not sustainable unless somebody pays for it. So it's so if you want it accessible and sustainable, then it is not free. So then you if it's nobody, no federal agency pays for it, you have to pay for it. Or some then then you have to pay for it. Anyway, so this brings up a bunch of questions. How can one ensure a steady long-term support? Who do we trust with all this irreplaceable data? And how can we decide what to preserve and when is time for a, put a database into the code freeze? We need a new trusted intermediary, but building trust is hard and losing it is very easy. You screw up just once and our, your, your users go away. So there are long-term life cycles, which are relevant. And people talked a lot over the years about the data life cycles, how new data standards emerge, metadata standards change, usage patterns change. But as we are not serving up the data anymore as, as simply dead objects, as files. So we, we are usually presenting them through smart services. So there is also a service life cycle. Browsers change, operating systems change, the database platforms change, new programming languages appear. So IPython, Jupyter appeared, machine learning. So now everybody wants to machine learning on running on top of the data. And even the servers become obsolete and this die. And this seems to be the most mundane things. But here is a picture of the disk that died since we started Sloan, 1885 dead drives. 1.1 tons of hard disks. And this is only two and a half percent of annual disk failure. So we are actually very much on the standards, but even just keeping up with this is actually quite demanding. So it's worth to think a little bit about the business model of data. So first of all, what is the value of data? What is the, how can we measure the value of usable accessible survey data? And why, how can we measure it? It accelerates ideas, you know, it generates paper basically. So that this is the most important thing. So one can ask, one good metric would be how much science funding does a data set attract? What do I mean by that? When somebody gets an NSF grant, they get 300K for three years. And it's if they generate typically two refereed papers is a good performance. The person who gets the grant has a choice of using their money to work on any data set in, in the analysis of any data set they, can, they want. And so it, it's a good measure that how many of these papers are related to use, are using a certain data set. People vote with their own money. So this is actually, they put their money where their mouth is. So it implies that if we do $50,000 $50, per paper is a good measure. And, and maybe we should roughly double it to make it a round number. So 100K per paper, because also there was some money invested altogether, you know, in telescope follow-up time and so on. In any case, this is not 10K per paper and not 1 million per paper. So, what is the price of data, which is different from the value? Price is that how much did it take to produce? So for example, for Sloan, it, it was up to Sloan 4 was probably a little over $200 million total. LSST will be probably over a billion. We also just heard that SK is going to be multi-billion dollars. So one can start comparing the price versus value. So Sloan enabled of the order of 9,000 refereed papers so far. Okay, so 9,000 by 100K per paper, that's essentially 900 million in value. So this means actually the $200 million were on a sweet spot. It was well invested because it generated more usage than what it cost to produce the data. And one can argue there is a third component to the business of data. What is the cost of data? And here, what I mean, how much does it cost to actually maintain the data once we stop taking it in? Once, once the project became dormant. So, so far, this has not been too much of an issue because most of the projects in astronomy today, which were generating big data are still alive and producing data. But this is by and large, 
we start to see the end, the beginning of the end for many of them. So Sloan probably has one more like cycle. Sloan five is running now, but it's not clear whether there ever there, there will be a Sloan six. Penn stars basically the survey shut down. And this dark energy survey is going to run for a few more years, but we can see that they will all sunset. So what happens to the data? Who will take ownership of it? <clears throat> who will remember what it is and who will pay for it? So for Sloan, our rough numbers, probably rounded up a little bit, is about 500K per year. So this is, when you look at it, this looks like a big number, okay? But when you see that this is like five papers, if it generates five papers, then it already kind of is on par with the benefit to the community. And if I look at it, what is in, in terms of the price of the data, this is a quarter of a percent to maintain the data for one year to the, what, what it costs to produce the data. So a 5% cost overrun in the survey would have covered the data for 20 years. If, and it turns out that if we put a much smaller fraction of it into a retirement fund when the survey was started, you know, it would already, we would have enough money to run the survey, the archive forever. And this is not a bad approximation necessary because when you start a survey, you know that essentially the day will come when the data will retire. And, but it doesn't mean that it's dead. So, so this notion, this way of thinking should actually permeate our survey design. How do we analyze the data? That is also changing. And it's good to look at the music industry for a minute. So when I wanted to listen to music, I had to buy an LP or a CD and take it home and play it on my record player. Then came iTunes, where I could actually, don't, didn't have to buy the record, or I didn't have to buy an LP. If there was just one song I wanted to listen to, I could actually buy it on iTunes and download it, but I still had to download it to my physical device and listen to it. And these days we have Spotify and Pandora where something happens somewhere far away and I get a stream of the music on my device. I don't even know what is the format. Some come in OGG, other come in WAV files, other come in MP, MP4. Anyway, so, but all it's happening in a stream, where, but I have enough bandwidth to essentially saturate my senses. What happens in astronomy? The data equivalents are, we used to download all the data and we send tapes, disks, or we send sneaker net around the world. This is the equivalent of buying an LP and take it home and play it on our own, play the music on our own device. Then came the databases, the SQL server and, and the database oriented projects. This is where we basically take the data by a song. We specify a subset of the data that we want to listen to or play with, and then we basically download it still to our own devices. But what is coming essentially like Google Collab or this is where we are pushing with the size server. This is what LSS, so many of the projects are trying to build such interactive environments where everything happens in the cloud side. We don't even know again what the file formats are. We just basically massage the data and, and see the results. So we are in between today. Ideally, we, everything should be in the cloud. And that would be the best of all words, except that it costs too much. So right now we can't pay for it. So we are somewhere in between basically. So we are starting to look beyond just downloading the data, pieces of the data with a query, but we can't quite afford yet to move into the cloud full fledged. What happens to our data in 30 years? So once again, to today as a community in science, not just astronomy, we spend billions of dollars to acquire valuable data. Most of these will not be superseded in the foreseeable decades. At the end of the projects, the data sets will be handed off to someone because it's not appropriate to actually, it takes different skills to run an active projects data and the data management than what it takes to actually run an archival dormant data, which is not growing, but the metadata still needs to evolve and it needs to preserve essentially the corporate knowledge. So we need an organization that has a long track record with a predictable future. It understands data preservation. It's trusted by everyone. It's technically capable. 
can run under a sustainable model and has no single points of failure, in a sense like the Smithsonian. So where is the Smithsonian for digital data? It doesn't exist. There is another aspect, prioritizing for relevance. If I asked everyone, do you have enough data or would you like to have more? I have not seen a scientist who would not have said, I want more data. But it's the wrong answer to an ill post trick question. Because what, what I mean is that, do you have enough? So, so what people understand mentally, how they translate it, do I want more relevant data that helps my science? They don't want to be more garbage dumped at them that they have to do 10 times more work to sift through. So th there is a delicate trade-off between the scientific value and the cost of preservation. So one extreme is that store everything and go bankrupt because you can't afford to do anything else. All your money goes into basically saving the data. Or the other extreme is that throw away too much and then you don't have enough for the science. You throw out the kid with the water. So there is an LHC lesson. Particle physicists spend decades to figure this out. So basically, and the LHC, they have this $10 billion plus data source, multiple experiments step into the beam lines, and then they set up hardware triggers to filter data, but they keep only one in 10 million events. And it took a decade to, to precisely define the thresholds so that they essentially throw away the least of the events that lead to new science or have the potential to lead to new science. And we have to, I think, adopt this kind of thinking and the resulting small subset is still you know, 10 to 100 petabyte, and it keeps the whole community busy for a decade or more. And whether we set our threshold, you know, one in 10 million or one in 10% or 99 to one, that's, that's up to the problem and up to the survey, but we can't afford essentially, soon, soon we will reach the point when we can't afford to store everything. We have to make this trade off somewhere and we have to start thinking consciously how can, we, how can we make those decisions in a most rational way? So, and this is where I think some, some interesting thinking is emerging. So what is next? Can we actually do experimental design by AI? So essentially, instead of more data, we need more relevant data. So we need dramatically improve our experimental design. And so we typically use the AI in large scale experiments after the data has been taken to get better results out of, out of the numbers. But maybe what if we used AI before we collect the data? So, you know, in the next generation astronomical surveys, getting a spectrum is a thousand times more expensive than the imaging. So we need to essentially, we can only target one thousandth of the targets if we spend equal time. Okay, so then how can we trust basically neural net algorithms to make these decisions about the target selection? So here is a kind of a prototype project. We are working with Princeton and Hopkins on, in the, the context of the PFS project. So could we put actually the telescope into a reinforcement learning loop? and active learning loop where we basically gradually improve the target selection as the survey progresses, because otherwise we would know by the end of the survey what we should have targeted in some cases. So what does the future look like in eight to 10 years? Everything is commoditized, everything is accelerating except universities. And I mean, that's a good thing. Actually, we need a little bit of stability, a place where you can do some deep thinking where we are not just rushing forward. Everything will be in the cloud. We simply cannot compete on scale with the economies of scale. So that we will probably have some local computing resources, but by and large, everything will be in the cloud because the business parameters will change in such a way that it will actually be affordable. So what will be the role of machine learning in science once the hype settles? We will need to use excessively physical insights, symmetries, physics infused machine learning, build you know, neural net architectures, which actually resemble the physical symmetries of the problem we are trying to solve, etc. Then discover sparse representations, proxy simulations, instead of generating you know, spect stellar spectra or galactic spectra, you know, we should be using actually autoencoders like Andy has been doing we need explainable in inference. 
many experiments will be driven by AI, but we will always need trusted intermediaries and trusted data sets. So these are the roles that we have to consciously start to design now. And it will take, you know, five, at least five years to get there, to build up the trust. So, but we have to start it now. How can we future-proof our computational model? We need to get, I like this word, the future-proof trajectory that can adapt over the years and we don't have to throw it completely away in five years when we are kind of migrating all the way to the cloud. We need to start beginning this gradual migration now and which everything we do, we should, it should be done with, the, with having this ultimate goal in sight. So right now in the short term, we need to keep the main long-term data out of the cloud simply for, for financial reasons. And we have to figure out how can we move enough data just in time for example, AI training needs a lot of cycles, but no long-term storage. Maybe if we can stream it for free into the cloud, do the computations there, and then just take out the, the results, which are much smaller, that's a viable, so that's a viable way to use actually our cloud dollars. We need cross correlations between data in different clouds. So I think there will be a talk later in the workshop about this, but this is going to be a big deal because there will be no single cloud provider who will have all the data that we will need for the analysis. Most likely because of the business competition reasons, half of the data that we need will be on Amazon, the other half will be at Google. So actually how do we do the do the merger and the joint analysis. We need to start thinking about condensed approximate representations of the data, sketches, and so, there are so interesting new data structures which are emerging in computer science. And find just enough hardware to run the train models locally. But we need to move better by data sets fast. And this is what we actually designed the open storage network projects project where we are trying to build a petabyte scale apply cheap appliance that can sit in critical places in the infrastructure and can transfer a petabyte in a day. So it can saturate the 100 gig networks and it can also store petabytes of data. And we are trying to place this at, at critical locations near big computer centers and near some big, big instrumental facilities to actually create a fault tolerant distributed storage and data movement model. And in any case, we should not lose focus on preserving the valuable data sets. This is really the main take home of the stock. This is not hardware intensive. This is not even expensive. It is just unfundable today, the way the funding agencies are thinking about it. So we need to create a community pressure to make this happen. The hard thing is preserving the deep knowledge of the data, it's in people. And once again, you know, like running the Sloan archive is a quarter of a percent of the year of the cost of collecting it. And if you work it out for your own project, you will see that the numbers will be very similar. So this is trivial. So we need a national endowment for high value scientific data. This is what made the Smithsonian happen when the Smithson, Smithson gave actually the money. And then it was of course not enough, but it was augmented than the federal government, but it keeps, which keeps it going. But the original, the original idea came actually from a private foundation. Summary. So open big data is at the forefront of all science that um, disruptive technologies changes happen, keep happening, and they will keep happening. We basically made much of the data strategy as up as we had, as it happened. And many of you are here actually sitting around the screen and you remember how it all went down by adopting to changes and challenges as they arose. And the funding, and we are still doing it because we are entering this new phase when some of this data is starting to become dormant and we need to actually figure this out again. And funding is much slower and always reactive. So it was never going in front of the challenges. It was always following the challenges five years later. We are spending billions on big experiments, yet we have no plan for long-term data. <clears throat> we are improvising again. And the problem is here that if we actually screw up and we, we lose data, at least in one of these projects, there will be such a national embarrassment that would create action. But, but that would be a tragedy because we wasted a lot of money. So let's not wait until, until we actually do the wrong way. For scientists, how can we make our adaptation more agile? 
So at least, you know, go a little bit closer to how the industry is actually evolving and reacting to things. How can we steer towards long-term sustainability, which goes in the opposite direction? Who is the trusted intermediary to deal that we trust with our data? <clears throat> and we need to keep reinventing ourselves over and over. That's, that's the biggest challenge. And so I'd like to finish with a Lewis Carroll quote. You know, you see, it takes all the running you can do. This is where we are today to keep in the same place. If you want to get somewhere else, you must run at least twice as fast. And this is what is coming. So thank you. Thanks, Alex. Um, we have a lot of questions, a lot of interest. Uh, I think virtual applause needs to Alex on there. And I'm going to use my chair's prerogative and jump to Stephanie Juno's question first. A uh, very nice and thought-provoking talk on the idea of AI-driven experiment design. How could we mitigate the fact that the AI is biased being generated by humans and not by the universe? At least it's not biased in the same way as the North social network trained neural nets are. <clears throat> so in a sense, you know, we can, we can choose the way we, we train the neural networks. And I think training the networks actually in a reinforcement loop while we are collecting data, this means that the network has to adopt to what the real data shows and not how we started out with. So, so that, that's, so I'm totally sold on the idea, but the challenge is that how can we then mitigate the fact that our sampling strategy changes dynamically during the survey? So we, we cannot do it, we cannot do it too much. So we, we have to do like, if there is a major revision in the sampling strategy, we have to do this kind of probably once a year or so. So there are a couple of discrete phases like major data releases. We otherwise, otherwise, you know, it will be impossible to reproduce or build synthetic models of what the survey was looking like. At the same time, I can imagine like dynamically adjusting the exposure time when an object reaches a certain signal to noise, we can stop exposing it further, for example, and to switch fibers to another object. That would not be a major disruption because we could say that the, we don't quite know what will be the signal to noise for that object ahead of time, but we can define its scientific utility as a function of signal to noise. And we can say ahead of time that our sampling strategy is that we, for example, dynamically adjust basically the, the exposure times to, to reach a constant signal to noise on all objects, et cetera. So these are some of the things that we are exploring right now. But, but you are quite right. This is a problem. And, and you know, this is how we seem to mitigate. Uh, just uh, Ross, uh, thank you for joining. I don't, know, I don't know if you got all of Alex's talk. I hope you got most of it. We're running about uh, 25 minutes ahead of schedule. Uh, just so, just for your information, because I know you joined a little bit later. And, and Andrew's up, Andy Connolly's up next in when we finish the question. But there are a few more questions, we have time for them. So um, jumping back to the first question was from uh, Brian Gainsler, um, saying that you've talked a lot about uh, data sets and archives, and I think you jumped a little bit to Sloan. Um, and he says, I have 100 terabytes of raw and processed data on my desk from my projects. Mm -hmm. If something happened to me, um, you know, those data would be lost and forgotten. And with so many astronomers around the world with their own data sets, mm -hmm. we have a strategy to curate and archive these collections. Mm -hmm. And uh, Robert Nakuta followed up saying it's a great, a great question. Um, how do people prepare for the bus that hit you scenario? I think this is a long tail of data sets, but go ahead. Yeah. So this is kind of between the short tail and the long tail, a hundred terabyte data set. But I think it faces the same challenge. So there is no place to put it, right? Yeah. And, and, and the problem is that, and, and it's not the disk space primarily, but what would it take to actually document so that this data set is actually usable for the future? And how can we do this? And what comes to mind is the Facebook example. So the way Facebook started out is that there were basically pretty useless small data at Harvard about the dating habits of a handful of students. And this was completely useless for anything. And then it started to grow. And, and when the, the data started to grow beyond the critical size, suddenly new connections appeared, basically in this high dimensional space of where everything is connected to everything. And suddenly new, new context and new clusters emerged. And then 
this still required a lot of manual markup and the likes and so on. And the, but afterwards, Facebook got better and better in automating all of this. So, so I think one way would be to create something like a Facebook of astronomy data where people can just easily upload almost drag and drop with a minimum amount of metadata, like who is, what is my username or what is my ORCID ID. Then we could have a robot go in and look up all the papers of the data author. And I bet that there are papers with tables in them where the table headers refer to the columns that is in the data. And there is a project that Google did, actually Alan Halevi called the, what was it, web tables. They crawled all the tables on the World Wide Web at the time, and they showed that just from the tables alone, they could figure out most of the meaning of the data in the tables. We could do this in astronomy, and this would, this would kind of relieve the authors of, of doing that by hand. And suddenly, I think we would, we would see that a lot of very interesting connections would emerge in such a data set. But this is not for the faint-hearted. But I think the technology is here, actually, to do this. There's just somebody has to have the will to do it. And the funding, to some extent. I mean, it takes a little bit of something to set it up, I guess. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, and uh, well, I think uh, Robert uh, Nikuta also just mentions that uh, he wonders if you've seen Matthew Graham's talk at ADAS, where he started with a slide from his previous talk 10 years earlier and went on uh, with his talk about where we'll be in 10 years and how much the uh, old slide showed just how wrong he had been. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, absolutely. So, I, well, I should look at some of my indeed. That would be a good thing to do. But generally, I think the technology has evolved much faster. So basically, when, when the technology changes leapfrogs in every two years, every two or three years, which has been the pace, you know, that's a three folding time in 10 years. So it's, yeah, so I don't, I don't think we can make much tech technological predictions. So I try to make sociological predictions, which also, you know, is, is risky, but, but you know. But um, uh, Vinicius Placo, and I hope I said that correctly, a uh, naive question for Alex, in the context of dormant data sets, how do you keep users engaged in continuing generating value, e.g. value-added catalogs, et cetera, while there may be much more attractive data set to work with? I, I think the, the value of a data set is really determined by the users. So I think if, if a data set remains in use, then people will generate additional value added extensions to it. They will do the cross correlations or combine it with other catalogs. And, and, and this is, these are the hard choices. So we should actively monitor and establish some reasonable metrics. And we should never delete those data sets because as, as the storage capacity is exponentially growing, the, the cost of storing the bytes is minimal, except that we should, you know, not put it on a hot server in multiple copies in a load balance fashion, et cetera. So that should be all reflecting essentially the usage and the usage patterns. But, but we can put, put the activity, so we should spend the dollar spent on curation and data sustainability in such a way that somehow it's reflecting essentially the relative value assessed by the usage in the community. Uh, there, so there are two more questions here. Uh, JJ Cavillars, uh, given how fast the commercial side goes, can science users keep up with the tech changes? Uh, we need some improved support for how to use technologies which yeah. requires continuously refreshed work. Yeah. For, uh, 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 workforce yeah. supporting 40 yeah. years. Yeah. Absolutely. And this is, I think, why we need these trusted intermediaries. You know, so in some way in data publishing, the, pub the commercial publishers have been playing this role for many decades. And they, and they are the perfect example of how the technological changes have kind of leapfrogged over them. So, so, the, so, so, we, so we need some organization. I don't know who and what that organization is at this point. I, I don't think anybody knows, but if you do speak up, 
but but it will probably nothing like what we have today. It will be more probably. I hope it will be much more distributed in the community. So it's no no single point of failure, no single federal agency which with a stroke of a pen can shut down its all its archive like the EPA has done under Trump. So 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 we need to have something which is can tolerate all those changes and can survive, and. Okay, the Catholic Church has survived over, you know, hundreds of years. That's one of the longest surviving organization. University libraries are this, probably the second longest since Alexandria. So maybe some combination of not the church, but the university library is getting involved, but they don't have currently the technical knowledge yeah. and technical skills to do this but that can be taught or one could set up maybe organizations between university libraries and, and these science groups or data science institutes and, and have it, if we have a hundred instances of that, then it starts to be sustained, maybe fault tolerant and sustainable. I, I, I don't know. Uh, Laura Trujillo says for Alex, great talk, thank you very much. Uh, what's your opinion on quantum computation? Do you believe that that maybe could help us a little bit with data storage? I don't think that I haven't followed the quantum computing as closely as so I'm at an age when I don't think it will be very practical in my lifetime. So therefore I try to focus my attention or energies to some things that you know may remain relevant while I'm still kicking. Uh, I, I don't think it's much about storage. It's more about very large scale optimizations. Like, you know, essentially today's quantum computers are largely like, like uh, large Ising models, which can solve kind of find the optimum equilibrium state of a constrained large scale system. And if we can find some problems in, in astrophysics that fit that pattern, I think they will be very useful, probably shorter on a shorter scale rather than longer, but they are not your usual procedural computer. Certainly. So, so there will be certain problems that it can solve, you know, millions of times faster. I, I don't quite see yet what that would be in astrophysics. I think we take really the last question. Uh, I see Dylan Nelson just uh, the, the, because we haven't covered uh, theoretical data sets. He's asking from the simulation products, do they, they face identical challenges uh, as observational data? Are there additional considerations of interest for theoretical data sets? Oh, yeah, thank, thank you very much for asking that question. And, and I think that is very good. And I think the future will be nothing like what we see today. So today we have kind of, in many ways, very similar simulations run by competing group where they do incremental improvements against each other's computations. But the trend with supercomputers is there are fewer. And so essentially for a long time, supercomputers were driving the technology. Today it's Google and, and Facebook and Amazon are driving the technology. So the supercomputing is becoming increasingly a niche market. For defense and other reasons, we are still working towards an exascale computer or exascale computers. So typically when we have an exaflop and we will have of the order of a billion nodes on the machines, then we will, uh, the problems will also, the resolution of the problems will grow. And so the lapse time of the, to run a simulation will remain the same if not getting worse, because the scaling with resolution, it's a high dimensional problem. So what will happen is that today, many groups can afford to get enough time to run the world's largest simulation that makes it to the New York Times cover page or, or the second page. Okay. At that point, we will reach the point when all the world's cosmology simulations have to full form together and run a, a single simulation where they will pr plug in the modules into the beam lines. So that will be like the LHC accelerator in that will run a big computational model and the different groups have to add up because none of them can by, the, by their own get enough time on the world's largest computer of which there will be very few only. So it will be much, much sparser resource than today. So we have to start thinking about APIs, et cetera. Vandana just added to that, do, do the simulation sets become obsolete, unlike observational data, or uh, are the demand for preservation the same? Uh, 
No, probably, probably not. So it will probably be similar. So in cosmology, we have such an enormous range of dynamic scales and we are faking it. So there is no single simulation that could handle from star formation or the atomic and molecular scales all the way to cosmology. So we are run, right now running kind of embedded simulations where maybe we take the boundary condition of the larger scale simulation into a smaller box and then run it separately with slightly different physics. So, so this, this, and these code developments are such a big effort that again, they will not be superseded very quickly. So typically write a new embody code, especially not to mention a hydro code with radiation transfer, is probably a 15 year effort for a serious group. So we, you know, the, the Fokker's code recently, the Arepo code was the latest one that emerged and he worked on it for 10 years. So, so it's, it's, I think we are kind of seeing the convergence to convergence towards an LHC model. And, and by the way, one other thing, these new supercomputers will be very heterogeneous. So they will have TPUs, a, a TPU layer, so special coprocessors to do machine learning and AI. And I think one way to actually use it that we solve the hydro still on the regular nodes. And while at the same time, this neuromorphic layer in the computing actually looking for interesting patterns in the data while the simulation is running and only store those events which are genuinely unique. So one in a thousand events or one in a million events because otherwise we cannot dump all the memory in every time step as we used to, so. Thanks Alex, uh, thank you very much. And I think we should, uh, we should move on and I'll, I'll take my 10 minutes of float that's left for 11 minutes and we'll hand it over to Andy. Uh, Connolly to bring us up from, from University of Washington, from the uh, Dirac Institute, uh, who's going to talk about um, data science across the research communities. So I need to can share and take over. That would be great. Looks good. Not full screen yet. Perfect. All right. So you see my, um, the actual slides, not the notes. Yep. Looks good. Okay. Great. Okay. Um, uh, Thanks a lot, Will. Um, so, so as Will says, I'm, my name is Andy Connolly. I'm the uh, director of the eScience Institute at the University of Washington. So eScience is um, the institute um, at UW that is, tries to access the hub for uh, data intensive uh, um, data science uh, across the campus. Um, and so what, what I thought I'd do is I would build off a little bit of Alex's discussion about data and the preservation of data. Um, and, and what I'm actually going to do is to uh, describe some of the emergence of data science, um, both in terms of astronomy and looking more broadly um, at data science across uh, different research communities. And so to give you an overview of what I'm gonna cover, um, I'm gonna start by talking about the, the development of data science. And in particular, the, the rationale beh behind the emergence of uh, data science institutes um, growing to the, the uh, well over 100 data science institutes that are distributed um, around the globe at the moment. I'm going to reflect a little bit on what are the common components to these data science institutes. Uh, and I'll talk some about something about some of the technological developments, but also focus on some of the sociological uh, changes about how we build collaborations and how do we get different groups uh, from different research, um, uh, uh, research domains to actually uh, talk to one another. Uh, and in particular, I'm gonna look at some of the, um, the, the programs that have been developed by uh, the data science institutes that have established a, a long-term mission. And then looking forward to the emergence of um, all of the experiments that we've heard about um, over the last uh, couple of hours, whether it's the Rubin Observatory, whether it's SKA, whether it's the Roman Space Telescope or Euclid, to look at what are the opportunities and challenges um, that, that are going to impact data science as we try to do our science um, uh, in, in the next decade. And if I get that time, and I guess as we're, we're running a bit ahead of time, um, hopefully I will, I'll get to talk about some of the um, emerging trends and, and touch on something that I think Alex um, was raising towards the end, and that is the emergence of the need for software engineering, um, both on the campus within, um, within data science institutes, 
um, and more broadly in terms of the experiments and the research that we want to do. And, and some of what I'll talk about will reflect um, on what Alex was talking about. Some of it will relate to some talks that you'll hear in the next couple of days from Colin Slater and Denny Lee, who are going to be talking about building scalable tools for, for science. And also some of it will touch on the, on the need and the challenges associated with cloud that I think Ross is gonna talk a little bit about um, in the next talk. So we talk a lot about the emergence of data science and astronomy, um, both over the last few years and also driven by projects such as the Rubin Observatory. But in, in reality, data intensive research has been driving astronomy for decades, as Alex has shown with the emergence of the STSF. I mean, this went back to the original photographic plates with uh, Shane and Wurton and eyeballing the, uh, the lit plates counting the number of galaxies within 10 by 10 up minute pixels, generating a, a million pixel view of, um, of the universe, producing some of the first large scale structure or enabling some of the first large scale structure uh, measurements in terms of the clustering of galaxies. It's interesting to think that if you went back and did the eyeballing of these plates using citizen science techniques, you could do what took uh, Shane and Worden on the order of about a decade in, in a few minutes. Um, the first digital surveys were not really from CCDs, though we talk about CCDs a lot um, in terms of the current surveys and future surveys. The first digital C um, surveys were really the scanning of photographic plates uh, undertaken with microdensitometers, where um, so, um, scanning plate technology such as the APM um, survey in, in Cambridge could scan a, a five degree region of the sky. So 25, five by five degrees, 25 square degrees on the sky could be scanned in the, in the time of four hours to actually detect all the stars and galaxies on those individual plates using just a, a Pentium Pro 200 megahertz um, uh, machine. But this generated the first terapixel views um, of the universe. And then the real advances with CCDs were not so much the digital aspect, but the, the fact that they were linear devices, which improved the calibration of the data. And this allowed uh, projects like SDSS to run their Uber calibration, where they cross calibrated the different scans that they had across the sky and enabled them to produce photometric calibration or photometric zero points that were consistent to better than 1% across the whole of the sky. And what this allowed us to do was to actually be able to measure large scale fluctuations in the density of sources or of galaxies and then I enable those to be extracted from the data. So improving the science that you can actually do. So we often talk about this in terms of the volume of data, but if you look at the CCD data um, from the Sloan, it was actually smaller than the data sets that we were working with um, in the early 90s, where we're working with multi-terabyte data sets uh, coming from the digitized um, uh, photographic plates. So for me, it's not so much about the volume of the data that's driving this um, data intensive research, but it's about the, the science that we can do with it, the complexity of the analysis that we want, and in particular, the access to the data themselves. So Alex has talked about this in, in detail um, in terms of the impact of sky surveys. So let me just say a couple of things. If, if we compared the um, number of publications that came from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey to the number of papers that came out of this APM survey. So APM, um, the Cambridge group who digitized the Southern Hemisphere Schmidt plates. Um, the Schmidt plates were observed um, at Siding Springs um, in Australia over a period of, of several decades. And if we compare the number of papers coming out of the APM survey to those from the SDSS survey, what we notice is that the, the APM work produced fundamental um, cosmological discoveries in terms of the clustering of galaxies. But most of the results came from the teams themselves or small collaborations between the team working with um, external groups. For the SDSS, with the 9,000 papers that Alex was talking about, the majority of those papers come from groups who have no connection with the, uh, the actual survey itself. And if you look at some of the most highly cited papers, then the science cases for the, the most highly cited um, SESS papers, the, the science that was described there was, was never even envisioned when we were designing these surveys because it takes 10 years or 
sometimes 20 years to go from the initial design and the initial science book describing the science that you want to get out of the service through to the point where you've actually realized um, and delivered the data from the individual survey. Uh, and what this means is that what we need to build within the community is the ability to work with the data and the ability to think about the data in ways that are different than were initially envisaged when designing um, the, the data set itself. And an example of this is uh, the discovery of on the order of about 300,000 asteroids within the, uh, the SDSS data set, where the asteroid discovery was made, was actually derived from the fact that they were finding artifacts in the data. They were finding trailed images that had, um, that where the, the colors of those images um, de depended on, um, was effectively due to the fact that the source was actually moving as it as it moved across as it as the SDSS telescope scanned across the sky, and so by identifying these unusual coloured sources, they actually found that they could discover asteroids, and this led to the discovery of several hundred thousand asteroids, um, driving forward um, solar system science. And this um, this access to the data and the publication of the data and the drive towards open access to data is ubiquitous across many of the different research communities and sciences, whether this is from sensors, whether it's from social media, whether it's from government records and logbooks, or whether it's from um, uh, medical data or um, images of the brains in terms of neuroscience. And so the emergence of the data-driven um, science really led to the emergence of institutes um, who could actually support both the education and the development of the methodologies for working with these data. And so if we look at the emergence of uh, data science at institutions or data science institutions themselves, the first ones really started out in around 2000. And this was with the Computation Institute at the University of Chicago. About eight years later, the eScience Institute um, at the University of Wa Washington was actually um, uh, brought into being by Ed Lasowska, who was the founding director of eScience. And then in 2009, there was really um, a foundational publication, which was the, the fourth paradigm, Data Intensive Scientific Discovery. And this was based on and, and in honor of uh, Jim Gray, who had worked with Alex and uh, worked with the astronomy community to um, enable the SCSS um, archive to be uh, delivered using the uh, uh, Microsoft SQL Server. And this book was um, to honor the vision that, that Jim had, that the tools to capture, curate, and analyze data will provide a new way, not just of accelerating the science, but also changing the science that we can actually do with these large um, survey data sets. And that really catalyzed the development of the tools and that led to the creation of data science institutes, including Alex's in Institute, the Ideas Institute in 2012, all the way through to the, the Harvard um, Data Science Institute in, in uh, 2017. Um, and, and so if we look today, there's already, well, today there's about um, over 100 data science centers, whether these are centers, whether they're institutes, whether they're data science departments across the globe. And this comes back a little bit to what Alex was saying um, in terms of who can actually manage and curate some of these, um, of these data sets that we, we are generating. And, and maybe we are building up the sufficient number of um, organizations that can have the critical mass potentially collaborating with the libraries to actually be able to support both the development of the tools and actually support the, uh, the um, the archiving and the support of the actual data sets themselves. So what I thought I'd do is, uh, is to look at some of these institutes, uh, to look at their successes, and, and in, in some cases, some of the failures of these institutes, to look at what are the common components. And I think there are really six components that are common to the development of data science across a, a range of different communities. One of them is the creation of a community of practitioners. And this doesn't just mean people who are developing the methodologies. It also means people who are applying them and developing the applications and applying those applications to data sets to actually derive the science. There's the need for education of a diverse community. And this is both formal education, which means the development of curricula for data science uh, options. At the University of Washington, we have advanced data science options, which are mainly statistics and computer science. 
We have data science options that are aimed at the graduate uh, student population. We have data science options that are targeted for specific domains. We have undergraduate data science options today. And, and in the last um, nine months, we've just rolled out a data science minor that is targeting groups outside of the traditional STEM field. So actually um, working in the humanities and working in the, um, um, in, in, in the digital arts. And there's some really interesting science or research coming out of that. To support this, we also need to have informal education, whether it's office hours, whether it's um, uh, workshops or whether it's seminar series. And, and to support all of that, we need physical space. And so common to many of the um, institutes is a place where people can interact and benefit, benefit essentially from the water cooler effect, which means that we get serendipitous um, interaction with people who we don't normally run across um, and, and we learn from them. Uh, as, and to actually support all of this is needs personnel and personnel means that you require sustained funding to, uh, to provide the community with uh, the ability or people who can educate and, and train the community. The last one I talk about is ownership. Um, or the lack of ownership um, of data science uh, associated with particular departments, which I think is critical to um, the successful development of uh, data science programs and institutes. I'm not gonna talk about that here, um, but if people have questions about it, I'm happy to uh, come back to it at the end. And what I'm really gonna do is I'm gonna draw on the experiences at the eScience Institute um, and also the Dirac Institute, which is an astronomy data science um, institute at UW which I was the founding director of, and now it's run by Mario Jurich. Um, and I'm gonna draw from some of these experiences to talk about how we went about addressing these kind of six core um, aspects for developing data science institutes across the globe. So let's walk through some of these uh, components. Um, community, how do you actually create and sustain a community? And this isn't just creating a staff of people working on data science, but it's also on the development of the mechanisms by which we can share methodologies um, and we can educate people. And this can include things from, um, from office hours, which are essentially short-term engagements where someone comes in with a problem and you try to address that problem, through to workshops on um, emerging technologies, um, or on particularly particular computational themes and particularly workshops in touch across different domains by focusing on the methodologies and not the individual science cases. But I wanted to focus on one of the components that we found to be particularly successful at, at the University of Washington, which is the data science incubator programs. And this is really an engineered um, engagement because it's an, an engagement that lasts on the order of about three months. It's driven by proposals. So research teams propose to work with a data scientist from e the eScience Institute. Um, they have a project lead and they engage with one of the data scientists. And it's a commitment. So it's not like the goal isn't to have a hired gun that you provide someone with uh, a set of skills who does the work for you. It's that you both commit to spend two to three days a week working together so that you can, so that the research groups don't just um, advance their data science or advance the science, but they also advance their understanding of the data science itself. And so they learn about the methodologies. And so they go away with a, better, with a deeper understanding of the methodologies, not just the research uh, project. And the important aspect about this is the data scientists themselves choose those projects. So there is commitment in terms of time from both sides in terms of this kind of uh, uh, extended engagement. And at, the, the, at UW, we've had about, uh, run this program for about seven years. There's been a, on the order of about 43 projects. And this has ranged from anything from, as you can see in these figures, uh, attaching accelerometers to deer and looking for the motion of deer um, to relevant to, uh, or responding to different stimuli, which is known as the deer fear project, um, or also the, um, dimensionality reduction um, and applying manifold learning techniques to, um, uh, to spectra from the um, SDSS surveys. Uh, not all of these projects succeed. And I think that is a critical aspect because if every project succeeds and it's too simple, we're not actually experimenting, we're not taking risks um, on the analyses that we want, but all of the projects bring people together 
uh, and develop these um, pie-shaped people that Alex has described previously, about people who have expertise in a domain, um, as well as expertise in the data science methodologies. And the way we like to think about it is it, it creates essentially bilingual researchers where you can talk to people from different science domains and the way that you can communicate is through the computational and the statistical techniques that you're working on. And that often provides a, a, a more rapid way of breaking down some of the barriers so you can actually learn from, um, from different communities. Uh, to run these programs requires access to space. Um, and physical space is often overlooked in terms of um, how we can actually build data science communities, but it, it really is uh, critical to the to success and has been critical to the success of the eScience Institute. So at UW, we actually took the physics library and I'll, I'll be honest, that there was a significant amount of consternation from the physics community that we were taking some of their library space. But the library itself was a space that was, I think, the second most underutilized space on campus. Um, and, and, and by collaborating with the libraries, and I think this is a really interesting way of engaging with the library uh, community to allow us to um, extend what a library actually means to go beyond the, um, the storage of books to starting thinking about the storage of knowledge about how we work with data. And so as you can see from some of these figures here, the space itself, which is about 4,000 square feet, is configured for flexibility. It's configured to allow small groups to get, get together, to run workshops, um, to have a place where people can come and congregate. And, and, and the actual positioning of, um, of the eScience Institute within the university is fairly central to the, um, to the, uh, the science community across campus and is also is outside of statistics and computer science. So it's a fairly neutral place where people can actually convert. And, and the, the reality that, that driving this is, um, is funding. And that, I think this is critical. And so what has been successful for us has been a mix of funding, both in terms of institutional funding or state funding as we're a public university, but also support from um, individual foundations. And I think this, this joint public private approach to uh, supporting data science is something that, 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 that needs to be, um, uh, it, it needs to be, um, it, it needs to be sustained um, for essentially any of the data science institutes. The institutional funding provides support and long-term support for people. The um, foundational funding allows you to experiment with different ideas. Um, and expand out. And this is what happened with the University of Washington, where we started out with a small amount of institutional funding. We were awarded a more Sloan uh, data science environment, which is a collaboration between um, the Moore Foundation, the Sloan Foundation, and supplemented with uh, funding from the Washington Research Foundation. And once we'd established the impact of data science on campus, then the, actual, the university themselves provided permanent support. So the cost of actually running our institute is on the order of about uh, $2.3 million a year, half of which comes from, from institutional funding, half of it comes from, um, from grants. And the majority of the funding goes to people. And so I wanted to kind of reiterate what Alex was saying about the, the importance of actually maintaining um, long-term positions for people. So people in particular who work at the interface of the research and the methodological techniques, so some ideas, so, so the way that we have our mix of data scientists at eScience is a mix of 50% data scientists, 50% research scientists. And typically these people spend 50% of their time on their own research and 50% of their time actually supporting the data science activities. And examples of this include um, the Hack Weeks models that we've been developing. So week-long interactions, which are a mix of tutorials, uh, a mix of project-based work, um, and also peer learning where people all come together and actually work together for about a week. Um, we've actually spent a lot of time recently moving that into an online environment. Uh, and initially we saw this as a, just as the response to the pandemic. But what we've begun to realize is that there is enormous benefit from running a hybrid model where you have people in person and people online as it enables the um, better um, equity and accessibility to groups who can't actually travel. And this, um, and we've had a lot of success in running these um, hack weeks, whether they've been from 
um, you know, 20 to 30 people all the way up to some of these neuro hack academies, um, which can get up to about a thousand people in terms of running hackers. So what about looking forward and kind of the emerging trends that we're, we're facing, facing in terms of uh, data science? So we've heard about um, the, the data coming from the Rubin Observatory on the order of about uh, five to 10 petabytes a year, whether it's the Roman Space Telescope with imaging, say 400 million galaxies generating you know, four to around four petabytes of data, or all the way going, going all the way to the square kilometer array with the really breathtaking, you know, five terabits a second, um, which is really kind of the, the high energy physics um, uh, regime and archiving, expecting to archive on the order of about 600 petabytes of uh, derived products. Um, what we're actually beginning to see again is it's, it's less the, the volume of the data and it's more the complexity of the science that we want to do. And one of the reasons for this is that we actually build the experiments. So we, when, when the Rubin Observatory was designed and built, it was built with the computation or with the expectation of um, having the computational resources to be able to process the data and serve it to the community, but not necessarily to be able to do the science with those data. And so when we were working with the science collaborations associated with Rubin, we talked about what were the science um, cases that you wanted to run just in the first year of operations. And each of these nine science collaborations came up with uh, science cases that required between about 100,000 and 3 million CPU hours um, to, to actually process the first year uh, of data. Many of these science cases, as we'll hear over the next couple of days, require fast access to um, external data sets, so rapid cross-matching or real-time analysis of uh, events that are coming out of the, uh, the Rubin stream, data stream, or in fact, access to novel computational architectures. And I show you one of these examples that we, we have on, on, on the figures on the bottom. So I'm not sure how well this actually comes across in terms of the Zoom video, but the left-hand image should show you a little asteroid as it moves across the sky. The central part is if you could take those images and shift them, along the trajectory of that asteroid and then co-add them, so shift and stack these images, then essentially what you're doing um, is getting what you can see on the right-hand side, uh, which is a digital tracking of a moving source. So now you can see at the center of this object is actually the source that is moving. In this case, the telescope is actually tracking across the sky following this object, and you get a much higher signal-to-noise detection of these uh, slowly moving objects. And so with work that's been done by um, people like um, Hayden Smotherman at UW, you can um, implement these digital tracking technologies using GPUs, where you can now search for about a billion candidate trajectories in a single, in a minute. If you connect those, um, those that, that uh, shift and stack to uh, a deep learning network, network, you can get rid of the artifacts when you pick the, the wrong trajectory and actually just, uh, just identifying junk. And you can begin to identify a large number of, of, um, of asteroids. And if you apply this to the, um, the Rubin Observatory and the LSST, it would require on the order of about 10 million GPU hours of time, but that would allow you to uh, detect minor planets out to about 300 AU, which means you can begin to probe asteroids that were at one, part, one time in the inner Oort cloud and you can increase the number of TNOs that could be detected from the traditional methods, which we expect to detect about 40,000 TNOs with the LSST, and increase this by an order of magnitude by using different computational architectures at a significant computational cost, but increasing the actual reach of the, um, of the Rubin Observatory data sets without actually taking any more data by, um, by effectively an order of magnitude. Um, we're beginning to find that scaling up um, the science, the, the, the challenges that we're facing as we move to different, either to large scale or to different architecture, is that the tools themselves don't always scale, uh, aren't always robust to the scale of the analysis that we want to, to use. So many of these scalable analysis frameworks assume that the scientists are essentially working independently, right? You have all of the machines to process the data however you want. And they don't work it with this idea of multi-tenancy, where 
it might be lots of scientists or lots of researchers working on the same piece of data, but doing a different analysis. And we've seen in terms of the high energy physics community that the analysis codes that are used that apply to LHC data are three to four times less computationally, computationally efficient than the codes for analyzing or, or processing the data themselves or actually running Monte Carlo simulations. And this has led in uh, HEP to the development of things like data trains, where as you load in a piece of data, you run multiple different analyses, and then you run the next, you load in the next piece of data and you run the next set of different scientific analyses. And so some of the things that we've been working on at UW, and you'll hear more about this in the talk by Colin Slater and Denny Lee on Wednesday, is how can you actually analyze time series data? And so the left-hand image you see here is a, is a time series from the, um, is time series from the Kepler um, satellite and, uh, um, and time series from the Kepler satellite. And what you're looking at, this is Boyajin star. And so you've seen this unusual variability um, in, in terms of uh, uh, the, the actual variability of this main sequence star. And the interesting thing about Boyajian star is it was discovered several years after the data were completed. And so what we were looking at is, can you actually do this with time series data, say from the Zwicky transient facility? And this shows you some of the results. Um, and the important aspect about this is that the processing of a billion light curves took about three hours using about 32 instances on AWS. And, and, and so, that is um, that shows that we can, with these technologies, we can get to the point where we can begin to process data sets on the scale of the LSST. But what we what we find at the same time is that as we begin to use more of the um, essentially the industry supported analysis frameworks, whether it's Spark, which is written in Scala, whether it's um, using Kubernetes to kind of deploy the resources that, that we need that the, the, the systems that have actually been devised for industry, their functionality doesn't always map to what we need in academia. And if we want to start upstreaming some of the changes, say I want to change Kubernetes so it has the ability to checkpoint and restore a session, that that means that I need to have significant software engineering um, capabilities to actually take my changes and upstream them into the underlying core um, software infrastructure that has been used um, across you know, hundreds or thousands of, uh, of, of different companies. And that's not necessarily the sort of thing that we can do with, um, with, uh, with undergraduates or graduate students. And so this is driving us towards the need for, um, for software engineering on campus. And so, and as I'm coming up to the end of my time, I, what I'll just tell you about is a couple of things that we've been looking at on campus. Uh, we did a, recently did a survey at UW, and the question that we asked was, what are your actual research software engineering needs? So not data science, but actual software um, engineering skills. And what we found was there are over 30 FTEs of funded research or funded um, FTEs of work where people are actually looking for, for software engineering experience or expertise. And some of the comments that we were hearing is that it's actually really hard to find people with strong software engineering background. Um, and it's particularly hard when you only have a small amount of, um, of uh, resources that you may have a project that you want to work on today, but you, uh, or this year, but in, in two years time, you won't have the funding for it. And so we're beginning to see that there's, in, in many ways, a lot like the, the data science environments or where data science was about, um, about 10 years ago, where we had a, a lack of expertise in data science. We're beginning to same, see the same sort of things uh, occurring in terms of the software engineering. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities in terms of thinking about what are the roadmaps for the common software needs and common software infrastructure. So less about the compute resources and more about the, the, the software infrastructure that we need for science, whether it's across experiments in astronomy or whether potentially across different disciplines. And how can we actually come together to develop, develop a, a model to support, um, to, to support the creation of the software engineers who can begin to modify and adjust these industry standard tools um, and, and apply them to, um, 
to, uh, to the actual science cases that, that we actually uh, need. And, and an example of this, going back to what Alex was saying, is the, where is the boundary between what we expect our graduate students and postdocs to be working on? Um, for example, we, don't, we expect people to understand what Fourier transforms are, to understand how the Fourier of FFT works, but we don't necessarily um, require our, our graduate students and, and postdocs to write their own FFTs. We're happy working with TensorFlow and PyTorch in terms of designing um, uh, different architectures for our deep learning applications, but we're not necessarily making the fundamental advances in the underlying methodologies themselves. So what is the, wh where do we actually fit in in terms of an academic community when the resources going into industry are substantially larger than, than we actually have access to? So I'll just summarize with, um, We've seen the development of centers and institutes and departments of data science across campus and the development of the educational and the resource support of the educational and the research needs have really created these successful institutes that have been around for um, you know, at least 10 years and are now are essentially ubiquitous across um, many of the campuses that we're, uh, many of the campuses within the US and, and, and globally. Um, what we're beginning to see now is maybe there's, a, there's an emerging need for the, the software engineering talent um, to support both astronomy and other sciences um, and to go beyond just the application of um, our different um, uh, uh, science use cases to actually begin to develop some of the science software infrastructure to support what we need in terms of being able to work with Rubin or work with Roman or work with, um, with the SKA. And it's possible that the Data Science Institute may be a home for this development of software engineering, both in terms of the educational practices and also in terms of the development of the methodologies and the techniques. And I think we should be thinking about this. It may not be exactly the same model, but we should be thinking about this in terms of what we did for data science and what we might want to be thinking about in terms of software engineering. And with that, I'll stop there. I'd just like to thank and, and reiterate the support from the Moore and the Sloan and the Washington Research um, Foundations and this kind of public-private partnership that has been critical for really launching both the eScience Institute and the Dirac Institute. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Ross, do you want to just check your microphone very quickly? Hi, right, can you hear me? Perfect. All right. Okay. So, um, Andy, you, you ran over five minutes beyond your 30 minutes, but okay, we had 10 minutes. So we still have five minutes left. So we'll give you at least one of your questions. There are two here. Um, August Everard asks, in your opinion, how well is data science being integrated into university science domain curricula, both at the graduate and undergraduate level? I, I think um, we've done reasonably well with that. Um, at the graduate level, we've created um, data science options um, in terms, of, and I'm going to just talk about UW because I think it, it's very heterogeneous across the country. And I think there's a lot of work that could be done in terms of bringing the, the curricula that we've developed at different, essentially um, kind of some of the privileged R1 universities and use that to actually uh, distribute that uh, across um, other universities. At UW, we've actually developed um, advanced options that are aimed at people who really want to work in computer science, whether they're astronomers, but they're interested in the computer science. We've um, developed options that are that, or curricula that are targeted towards how do you actually get the science out with data science? And as I said, we're, we're beginning to expand that out. We started it out with graduate work and we're beginning to expand that out so that all the undergraduates also have access to data science. I think there's a lot of opportunities, as I said, to share that information. So I, I think we've done quite successful at, at UW and I'd love to see a mechanism that could be supported maybe by the national labs to actually distribute some of that curricula and some of that training across the, the broader community. And Vandana is just asking, um, well, to you or to any of us, uh, are e-science institutes having trouble hiring data scientists and software engineers because it's tough to match industry salaries? Yes, it's, I think it's the answer. Um, that, that we have had success in terms of drawing in people who have worked in the industry for a number of years, and then they want to come back and um, apply their ideas and techniques to academic research. We've also had some success, not, not at UW, but at other institutes, um, 
I know Caltech has had a lot of success about taking people for a couple of years before they go on to graduate school um, and embedding them in terms of providing um, software engineering um, expertise within different research groups. So bringing in computer scientists, trained um, students and embedding them in terms of research groups for a couple of years before they go on to industry or they go on to, um, to graduate school. And I think the, the draw is, and this is something that uh, the, I guess we were talking with the Zillow people at one point, the draw is the story is about the science that you can do and the impact that you can have on the science. And I think that still has a, a draw to a, a lot of people, even if you're just engaging with them for, a, for a, uh, you know, a couple of years or so before they go back into industry or go into industry for the first time. And, and you've probably lost some people to uh, to our Googles and Amazon friends as well as, as I have on previous projects. But I think 40% <laughs> of my graduate students now work at one of the Googles, Amazons or AWS. Yeah, and so I, I, for some reason, I, I don't get any any finder's fee for that. Yeah, but, I know. But Ross can talk about that afterwards. Um, uh, Robert Nikita just asks, uh, order of magnitude, how many full-time people, science and engineering work in those 100 or so science institutes? And I mean, across the, across the globe? I guess. I, I don't know. I mean, we have, as I said, we have essentially about 12 FTEs. Um, the institutes I know, they range from, I think that one of the hardest parts is actually getting funding for the research scientists. Um, so I, I, I don't know, it'd be an interesting question. We, we, I could look that up um, later on um, and see if I could dig up some of those numbers. All right, so we're giving Ross only one extra minute. Uh, welcome, uh, Ross, uh, Dr. J from Google, uh, who's gonna tell us a little bit about hybrid strategies and multi-cloud for scientific workloads. Um, and uh, take it away, Ross, share your screen. And Thanks, Will, for having me here. And I promise to, if you guys start training up software engineers, the secret is safe with me. I promise not to tell anybody at Google so they all get hired. I'm always amazed at the number of physicists that actually work at Google. Um, so I'm always happy to uh, take part in that. Let's see, I'm gonna share the appropriate window. Hopefully everything looks good. Awesome. So one of the things I hope to do is share a little bit about the perspective that industry has on this. We don't have as good a visibility into what's going on in academia, but uh, we have, of course, a lot of research in what's going on in industry currently. And, you know, we, I don't, think that multi-cloud or hybrid is a solved problem by any means. There are still a lot of outstanding issues, but hopefully I can give you something um, to you know, look forward to and at least have a little bit of forward vision on. Um, so my, I'm Ross Thompson. I'm a, a solutions engineer at Google Cloud. I like to remind people that I have probably have the best job at Google because I get to work with scientists all day long. Uh, as long as my bosses don't actually find out how much fun I'm having, I'll, I'll be able to keep doing this. So I, I hope to uh, be able to work with more of you in the future. So multi-cloud is, if you read the technical news at all, is like the latest buzzword for this year and maybe the previous six months. Uh, it's not that multi-cloud is a new thing. It's really been going on for years. Um, if you look at the numbers now, there's, I think the minority of people in industry are really working with only a single cloud, be it on premise, their own private cloud, or be it on Amazon. It's really come to the point where multi-cloud is the reality and everybody is moving in that direction if they're not already there. Um, the numbers really say it here, and this is a study from 2020 of the state of the cloud. And it says that, you know, people are doing 93% of respondents to this study, which was an industry study, said they're doing some kind of multi-cloud, now be it uh, a hybrid cloud model where they're working with their local on-premise machines as well as uh, machines on one of our cloud providers. So it's, it's not, this is new, it, people make it sound like it's new, because they're actually trying to figure out how do we manage this situation. Uh, it's not that um, there aren't techniques, but that the techniques are super complicated and it 
kind of ties back to what Andy was talking about in his session where it's the infrastructure management and the software engineering involved in this is non-trivial. So it's not something that you're just going to pick up instantly and find uh, a way to manage this. Although hopefully, you know, there are some solutions we can talk about. So what's the ideal situation for my salespeople? My salespeople would like to come to your institute and say, let's do a lift and shift. Let's move everything over to uh, Google Cloud and we'll give you secure access. We'll give you firewalls, login security. We'll give you process monitoring. We have all kinds of great models for storage. Whatever you need your simulation queue to look like, you have to have work for doing MPI jobs high throughput computing jobs, you need to run stuff with GPUs, we can give all that to you. Just move it all to cloud and shut down your data center because that's what Google Cloud really wants you to do. It's a beautiful model, secure, scalable, cost effective. That's where we get into start getting into arguments. So what does that mean that we're moving to multi-cloud? You know, somehow this is, I found this in one of our uh, marketing documents that our people seem to believe that it's just a worry about lock-in with a single vendor. I tend to disagree with that. I don't think that's really the issue either. Even with our industry customers, that's not really what's happening. What's really happening is far more complex. They also believe that you know it's just legacy applications that are slowing people down. I think the reality is that it's a lot of things like education. You need each cloud is different. People have established processes with their own premise centers. Um, each cloud has their own way of naming all the machines, or they have their own way of naming all of the services that go with it. You know, it's very rare when you see an overlap between the language that AWS uses and that Google uses. Um, we have different models for data storage, even though we try to show some kind of uh, similarity in our API access, but typically that's not the case. You know, uh, the only thing we all seem to be able to agree on is from the cloud service provider size is that, you know, you guys should just move everything to cloud. You want to rehost it. You want to replatform it. You want to refactor everything. So they're one's great on cloud. The reality is that's, that's not going to happen. Uh, you know, even in the industry, we have applications that are siloed just because they bought into a technology that's on one of the clouds, but typically they'll have more than one source where that's happening. The big thing I think is looking at data integration. You know, data is not, we talk about data gravity, but the reality is probably more like data inertia. We don't know where um, the data should be in order to make this an effective process. I try to explain to people that, you know, they talk about computing, but being uh, physics bound, but reality is where physics is really taking place is in transferring data. When you've got a terabyte of data and you want to move it somewhere, you really find out how much it weighs and how hard it is to move the data around. So that's really one of the key things that uh, is driving um, or actually thwarting a strategy around multi-cloud. Um, that and sort of cost management, um, you know, another industry thing is that we are trying to figure out how do you manage having multiple clouds? I mean, cost management itself is a big problem getting across the, uh, how do you understand how much you're paying on each of these systems, but then security on each of these systems. Google has a different model for doing it than Amazon. And how do you uh, understand data that's moving between these? So the short answer is it's complex. Now, from an industry standpoint, you know, we have tools, we have Google is always trying to sell things to make your life easier. And one of them is our Apogee platform, which works great for people who have applications that serve web pages and web services. You can wrap everything around your stuff that's on Google Cloud. You can wrap your things that are on um, Amazon and it all, um, it'll work out pretty reasonably. You can get a single interface because you've got this Apogee web service in the middle. When you're doing scientific computing, that's probably not the case. 
uh, you've got large amounts of data you need to crunch through and just wrapping them in an API is really not solving the problem. So we talk about the burst model, which in the case of, uh, we do a lot of work with Slurm and with HT Condor, the schedulers that people use in order to manage their scientific computing queues. Typically you set up a, an on-prem cluster, you'll have you know, controller node, login node, and then a number of workers on your on-premise cluster, this is all going to be fixed. So what happens is when you're fully subscribed and you need to have additional compute, you set up a VPN with Google Cloud, and then you can create a cluster in the cloud and burst your work up to there. Well, what happens when you need a petabyte of data that's on your local cluster to be available on the HPC cluster in the cloud to run, uh, run your jobs? That starts to become, it's still an unsolved problem, to be fair. So basically what we're looking for here is sort of a, a multi-cloud management layer. Uh, there are a number of tools out there where teams, companies like Omnibond and Nimbix have solutions. IBM has them with OpenShift where you can basically put a layer on top of multiple clouds and hopefully see relatively high level of virtualization so that you don't really need to worry what's happening on these other clouds. Google has their own solution. This is my only one sales, sales uh, slide. This is pulled directly from a sales deck. We have something called Anthos now, which is what our senior VP of uh, engineering calls the operating system for the cloud. Basically, what Anthos does is allows you to run Kubernetes, and we've heard Kubernetes before, it allows you to run Kubernetes on each of the different cloud providers and manage it and manage both the implementation from the sort of infrastructure as code point of view, but also allows you to manage the jobs and make sure that things are running well as they should be. So how is, how is that managed? Um, what it comes down to is, did I say it? Kubernetes. Everything should be containers. If you want to look for a strategy going forward, how do you get to be somewhat uh, insulated from the possibility of, or, or the, the, the dangers of uh, running on multiple clouds is to embrace containerization. Uh, the two main flavors of containers are from Docker and Singularity. Um, Docker is the one that runs primarily on Kubernetes clusters. Kubernetes is really not terribly well suited to running uh, scientific workloads if you're talking about batch workloads, although we're getting closer to having a decent batch solution that works with Kubernetes at Google. Um, but the fact is at Google, everything is a container. I don't know if this is a, a secret anywhere, but everything at Google is run on containers. Gmail, web search, maps, uh, our data flow products. Uh, this may even be a secret still is that our uh, Google Cloud Platform is basically all of our VMs are running on containers. So even stuff that seems like hardware at our end is actually a container, except for a few minor instances. So this is really the future of making things work. You get uh, with the containers, of course, you get insulated from the uh, OS. You don't really need to have your container can run everything it needs to without without regard to what kind of OS you're running it on. Uh, it's portable. You should be able to run your container virtually anywhere that supports the APIs you're, you're using. Uh, reproducibility is another key thing. I think scientific workloads probably have more, um, more interest to support reproducibility than almost anything going on in industry at this point. And hopefully, again, cloud agnostic. So what you really want to be able to do is run your job write it once, build it, and run it anywhere. So how do you manage that so that you are actually getting uh, a reproducible process? Because if anybody's in the audience has tried running Kubernetes, you'll know that it's, it's complicated and it's not easy. Uh, you're still embracing automation. So we'll auto, uh, basically what you would call infrastructure is code, but there's a few extra parts to that. So um, for building your infrastructure, your clusters, there's Terraform and Packer are two of the tools we use heavily for managing deployments. Um, things like Jenkins and Travis 
uh, are strongly used. Uh, Spinnaker, um, Google has their own internal tools for doing a lot of this infrastructure as code work. We have Google Cloud Build and Container Registry, where you can submit a job that as soon as you commit code somewhere, it basically kicks off a automation process to deliver the, uh, the new containers out to whatever application you're running. This again is not simple. Uh, it's going to be a fair amount of work to get hold of, but in the long run, when you have to start running this on AWS versus running it on Google Cloud, you're going to find that you've uh, it'll happen a lot easier. And that's one of the key things to being able to manage the multi-cloud is to get your automation working. Finally, data locality is really uh, the big problem. Um, it's like a chicken and egg problem. I like to think of it. We used to say, you know, you want to bring the data to the compute, but you should also be able to bring the compute to the data, which is where your chicken and the egg problem is, is that how do you move around these massive amounts of data? What are the, uh, what are the associated costs to doing that? Um, we, you know, we work at Google with a lot of people who are well aware of the cost of both storing things on Google Cloud and the cost potentially of egress if you're being uh, charged for taking the data out. So there definitely are sort of uh, social barriers in addition to cost barriers. But um, so just in terms of being able to manage data, there's a few tools out there. Of course, simple things like rsync and rclone allow you to um, have a data set in one on-premise and then clone it up to Google Cloud. IBM has a very sophisticated tool for doing data management and moving it around. Google has their own more sophisticated tool than rsync, which we call TSOP. It's got a great name. It's a transfer service for on-premise data, basically a container that you run on your local data center and it will sync up whatever data you want to Google Cloud. There's uh, CERN has Rusio, which is a very sophisticated uh, data management tool and um, DDN Luster, the Luster is a storage tool um, that uh, allows data to be moved around. But there's not really a great solution to it because of physics of having to actually move things across the wire. But one thing I will say from a sales pitch, of course, is that uh, if you're moving your data around outside of the Google network, you're basically hopping around through the public internet. And if you're moving things inside Google, uh, we have a lot of dedicated hardware and network, which is probably some of the best network in the world. Um, of course, there are associated costs. If you're moving things from Asia to North America, you're going to get charged egress charges, which again, with Internet 2 agreement we have um, with uh, academic institutions, a lot of the egress charges are waived. So we hope that going forward, uh, we'll be able to do a better job on that. So just in summary, uh, multi-cloud is the reality. It's not that this is a marketing word, it's a real thing that is happening. In order to uh, face up to that reality, containers are your friend. Make sure that you can figure out ways to run things in containers. Uh, take the discipline of starting to do infrastructure as code because that will make your life easier in the long run. And then sort of the unsolved problem with this is how do we, how do we move data around and what, what are people doing with data? So I'd love to hear your ideas. If there's stuff um, people are working on in this area that you would like to collaborate or at least talk about, uh, my email is drj at Google, Dr. J, and uh, just let me know. And I'd love to hear what kind of stuff you're working on. So thanks very much for having me and a real pleasure. Thanks, Ross. Um, and we're exactly on the end of our time. There weren't any questions. Uh, and I was just saying, I won't write you out to the Oracle for using their uh, write it once, run it anywhere byline. <laughs> no, do work, it's for that um, okay, is there, is there anything else or do we, uh, I see no questions. So I would say everyone open your mics and give a round of applause to everybody for all the talks today. And uh, the recent on micing. So thank you everyone for your talks. Well, I just want to thank all the speakers. Uh, it was an awesome session today. And I invite you all to come back tomorrow <clears throat> at 11.15, our time, okay? 
we're going to have more interesting talks tomorrow. All right. I see someone's typing a question, maybe Jordan Collier, but no. Okay. No question. All right. We're done, I think. Thank you, Luis. Thank you, everybody. See you tomorrow. Thank you. Um, Bye. Personally, be a bit late tomorrow, but I'll be I'll be on later. Okay. Hope you get your visa. <laughs>